You feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Well, good morning. It's lovely to be back in this very happy place. Um, you know that I now uh, work at Wheaton College, and one of the small delights of working there is looking out of my office window to uh, this lovely little building here. Uh, this is the Blanchard Hall, the oldest uh, building on campus. And the reason I like it is that in the 1860s, um, the college was founded by devout Christian abolitionists. And Blanchard Hall actually doubled in the 1860s as a place for slaves who were fleeing various parts of the country. And they came to uh, Wheaton College where they were fed and uh, clothed and housed and then helped to wherever they wanted to go for their freedom. And so I look out daily at this and I'm reminded of Christianity at its best. Christianity that moves in love toward the other in Christ's name. But of course, I know that's not the whole story. Some of you are probably sitting there thinking, yeah, but. Yeah, it, it's true that often these slaves were fleeing Christian households to find their freedom. And there's no doubt that Christian support of slavery really slowed down the efforts of the abolitionists and caused untold suffering. Um, there were other arguments for slavery. People often forget this. It wasn't just Christian arguments for slavery. Uh, did you know that there were economic arguments for slavery? There were political arguments. And above all, there were scientific arguments. And we often forget that. But somehow, at least to me, Christian arguments for slavery seem the worst because it's the absolute antithesis of what the Bible actually teaches about God's universal care and love for everyone. I mean, there had never been a, a principled argument from politics, economics, or science for the universal love and equality toward everyone, never. But there had been in Christianity. From the beginning, Christianity had said that every human being is made in the image of God loved by God, and that therefore God's people should move in love toward the other. And, and this doctrine of universal compassion absolutely changed our world. This is not just some preacher getting up here and saying Christianity saved the world. Uh, in fact, secular academics all around the world now acknowledge that it was Christianity that gave us this doctrine we now accept of universal equality. This is uh, Samuel Moyne, who's a professor of law and history at Yale and not a Christian. But we interviewed him and asked him about the origins of equality. He had, he had this very interesting thing to say. I don't doubt that, that Jesus Christ in particular um, brought about a revolution um, in thinking of people as, uh, as equal in the sight of God. Later, this idea of moral equality became an ideal of political equality. And there's no doubt that that's caused the world to change drastically. My point is twofold. The Bible insists on a principal doctrine of universal equality and compassion. And that God's people haven't always been awesome at that. Anyone want an argument about that? <laughs> no, of course not. And the reason I'm setting this up is that this twofold point seems to be the whole point of the book of Jonah that we've been studying for these four weeks, that God is moving in grace toward the other, the Ninevites. And God's prophet, is sort of moving in a different direction. 
right? I mean, you know how the book opens? You remember Sermon 1? God tells the holy prophet Jonah, please go to the far northeast and preach a message to Nineveh, those pagans. A message designed to bring those pagans into the family of God. What does Jonah do? He bolts as far as he can go to the southwest, to Tarshish, hops on a boat, boom, he's off there. And right in this opening paragraph of the book of Jonah, we've got a clue to the whole book of Jonah. God is moving in grace toward the outsider and God's people running in the other direction. And this theme rolls its way all the way through the book of Jonah. God, of course, sends a storm out here in the Mediterranean somewhere designed to turn Jonah around so he could get him back to Nineveh. But what does Jonah do when he's on the boat with those pagan sailors? He says to the pagan sailors, throw me overboard. I want to die. He would rather die than see those pagans up in Nineveh be included in God's family. And it's at this point there's a very interesting irony that the author of Jonah deliberately places in the book. Because do you remember the sea goes instantly calm and those pagan sailors, their idol worshippers, they turn to the Lord in this lovely passage. The raging sea grew calm and at this the men greatly feared the Lord and they did two important things. They offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Do you remember Brian pointed this out? It's a really beautiful, subtle thing that the author of Jonah does. Because these two very things that the pagans do, Jonah also mentions in his prayer inside the great big fish. He says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I righteous fellow that I am, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord and so on. At the very moment the pagan sailors are sacrificing and vowing to the Lord, Jonah is castigating pagans for not being as good as him in sacrificing and vowing to the Lord, right? And the author has deliberately put this in so we sort of laugh and feel a little bit sick at Jonah's self-righteousness because we know as readers what Jonah doesn't know that these pagan sailors are much better at responding to the Lord's grace than Jonah has been so far. And as if to underline the point that this is sickening to the Lord. This self-righteous tribalism is sickening to the Lord. The Lord commands the fish and it vomited Jonah out onto dry land. You know, I once preached a sermon on Jonah chapter two at my church in Australia years ago. And after the service, uh, someone came up to me and said, would you mind not using the word vomit in in church? You know, this is God's house. Um, I think spit would be fine, regurgitate would be fine, but not vomit. And I had to point out, actually, there are various Hebrew words for stuff that comes out of your mouth, and the author has deliberately used the disgusting one, kia, which means vomit. (laughs) So I'm going with what the text says here, because the narrator seems to be making the point that Jonah's self-righteousness and judgment on the other is nauseating to the Lord and to the fish. True to form though, God gives Jonah a second chance. Okay, I mean, it's, it's God, he, he's into that. And Jonah, you know, he's sort of got the point, you know, being vomited out of fish will do that. And so he makes his way all the way to the northeast to Nineveh. He preaches a message and on day one of his preaching tour, you remember what happens? The whole city turns back to the Lord, cries out for mercy. And we read that lovely passage Brian focused on last week at the end of chapter three, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways. He relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. God has mercy on the outsider. 
And in some ways, this would be a perfect conclusion to the book. If the book ended there, full stop, we'd know what the point of the book is, right? God loves the outsider, wants to have mercy on them, full stop. Fantastic. But actually, this is not the end of the story. There's a whole other chapter that sometimes gets forgotten. It's a little bit like Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. You know that parable of the prodigal son where Jesus tells the story of the young son who leaves the father, gets up to naughty things, and then realizes he's been an idiot and he goes back to the father and we read these lovely words. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And this is Jesus' picture of God. It's a wonderful conclusion. But as you all know, if you know the parable of the prodigal son, that's not how the parable ends. How does Jesus end the parable? With the older brother getting angry that the father embraced the young son. But the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. The end of the parable of the prodigal son isn't the father's mercy toward the outsider as beautiful as that is. The punchline is the older brother, the religious types, angry at God's mercy and God pleading his own people have some compassion. And why do I point that out? Because the book of Jonah ends exactly the same way, with the same theme, with the prophet getting angry. The punchline isn't God's mercy to the outsider. The punchline is the anger of God's people that God would have mercy on those disgusting people. And God's plea to Jonah, will you not have some compassion? And with that set up, I want Heidi now to read us Jonah chapter four. Thanks. Jonah four, one through 11. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up to, over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? I have two very simple points. Jonah's anger, God's compassion. Jonah's anger. He's angry like in Jesus' later parable of the prodigal son, the older brother is angry. And here is where we find out what's been motivating Jonah from the beginning. Why he went southwest when he was meant to go northeast. He was worried God would pull one of those abounding in love moves that he was so famous for. And he didn't want it, at least for the Ninevites. Actually, those words in verse two are really important. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, because they are a sort of Old Testament Jewish creed, a formal theological statement of what ancient Jewish people believed about 
the Lord. It's first used in Exodus 34, where we read, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jonah has all the right theology. He says all the correct things. He knows the nature of God, but his heart is a million miles away. He'd rather die, actually, than see the mercy of God poured out on the Ninevites. Take away my life, it's better for me to die than to live. What a warning to a Bible academic and to any Christian, really. It's possible to have all the right theology, say all the good things, but not have compassion, not share God's mercy. It's amazing how God responds, because I wouldn't have responded like this. I'd have clipped the prophet around the ear. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? And then we don't hear what Jonah says. It's just a question. Is it right for you to be angry? We as readers know the answer to the question, right? The answer is no. Jonah doesn't say no. What does Jonah do? This is astonishing. Jonah heads out east of the city. and There he made himself a little shelter sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. He storms out, makes his, his own little protest shelter. And th those, are, those are stunning lines. And waited to see what would happen to the city. He is still holding out hope that God is going to wipe out Nineveh. Even though God has shown his hand of mercy to Nineveh, Jonah's thinking, yeah, 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 but I, I, know, I know that God can judge. I, I've got some really good stories in, in, in the Jewish tradition. Maybe this will be one of them. It's a picture of tribalistic, judgmental religion. Arms folded, grumpy, hoping that God will pour out judgment on those enemies of ours. Even though we know God has shown his hand of mercy, especially in Jesus Christ. And so God responds with an object lesson, all about his compassion. When Heidi read this, I think I detected a few of you smile. I'm sure if you're meant to be sort of smiling at jokes in the Bible, like is that, but you are meant to detect humor here. All this stuff about the leaf and the worm and Jonah in ecstasy and then fury, right? I don't mean rolling on the floor laughing kind of humor, right? It's not that, but it's the humor of satire, the humor that stings as soon as you get the point. You smile and then you go, oh my goodness, there's been a bit of this throughout the book of Jonah. Uh, you've detected it already. Ready? Uh, go to Nineveh. I'm off to Tarshish. Oh Lord, I'm so righteous with my sacrifices and vows, unlike those pagan sailors. Vomit. And here in this last scene, it's more of the same sort of satire. I think we're meant to sort of feel that the joke is on Jonah. Uh, firstly, I mean, a miracle leafy plant pops up in like four minutes and, and gives Jonah a nice shade for his head, right? And then the very hungry caterpillar makes his first appearance in world history. <laughs> okay, maybe it's a worm. And it eats the plant. And then the shade is, is gone. And then adding to the satire is the extreme range of Jonah's emotions just in one paragraph. He's very happy about the plant. And then he's angry enough to, to wish he were dead. Wow. D Jonah is so passionate. He, he, he is a man who can go from ecstasy to fury in 30 seconds. 
but he's not compassionate. And passion, friends, is no substitute for compassion. I'll never forget a conference I went to. I was sitting at the back on these beautiful sort of theater seats. And then these young teenagers came, uh, three or four uh, boys came and they sat in my row and they put their feet up on the very nice chairs in front of them. I don't know, maybe they were the kids of adults at the conference, but they obviously weren't like totally keen to be there. And then I saw this family of Christians come and take the row in front, Mrs. Christian with a big Bible, Mr. Christian, little baby Christians. And as Mrs. Christian passed these young men with their feet up on the beautiful chairs, Mrs. Christian snapped at them and said, get your feet off those. How dare you? We pay a fortune for those chairs. The young lads took their feet off the chairs, blurted out something that I can't repeat in this context and shot out of the auditorium. And then I watched as Mrs. Christian put her Bible on the lovely chair. The music had already started and she raised her hands in passionate praise of the Lord. And I thought, yuck. And it also felt a bit like a mirror to my own soul sometimes. Passion without compassion. You know, I, I, I think I can find two passages in the Bible urging believers to be passionate. I can find about 200 passages in the Bible urging us to be compassionate. This is the whole point of God's object lesson with the plant and the very hungry caterpillar. And God explains it in the last uh, lines of, of, the whole, of the whole book. You, Jonah, have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? Uh, the key to understanding what's going on here is the repetition of the word concern, uh, which in Hebrew is the word chus, which means uh, pity or compassion. It's the word compassion. I think the translators balked at saying Jonah had compassion on the plant because it would make him a real weirdo. So they go for concern, which is a fine translation. But actually, Jonah does have compassion for the plant, <laughs> which is really projected self-compassion, I think. But anyway, and, and, and it's doubled because Jonah doesn't have compassion for this plant, but, and God has compassion for Nineveh. And so, in the very last verse of this delightful book in God's Word, God lists his reason... His reasons for compassion for Nineveh. And there are four of them. Do you spot them? The first is the sheer numbers involved. There are 120,000 people there. I don't want to bring judgment on them. God is moved by numbers. He loves individuals, but when he sees a whole bunch of them, 120,000, it moves him. You know, during the week I was chatting with Pastor Jeff and, and he told me that the area we as a church are trying to reach, I mean, I know we're trying to reach the whole world through our missions, but, but like the immediate area we want to bring the gospel to is about an eight mile radius. It, it, it takes in St. Charles and Geneva, of course, and uh, Elburn and North Aurora and so on. And I just decided I would throw in Wheaton, if that's all right. Um, <laughs> It's not really. And, 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 and Jeff said, you know what? Um, there's almost exactly 120,000 people in this eight mile radius. And because he's a nerd, he said, actually, 119,600. 119,600 in this immediate area. God loves every one of them. When God looks at this area, He's moved with pity. 
The question of the book, of course, is are we? Second reason for God's uh, compassion is that these people, they um, cannot tell their right hand from the left. There's general agreement amongst scholars that this is a metaphor for not really being instructed in right and wrong, in theology. It, it, it's a, a way of referring to spiritual ignorance. Now, to be clear, this doesn't excuse the Ninevites. Doesn't mean they're innocent. No way. We learned from the opening par- passage of the book that their evil has come up to God. But the thing is, spiritual ignorance moves God to compassion. And I guess the question is, when you see America in its spiritual ignorance or a certain type of American in spiritual ignorance, what's your first reaction? Is it annoyance? Is it smugness? Or is it compassion? Third reason, God feels pity for the city of Nineveh. I know this seems weird, But it's because God likes animals. The last words of the book in Hebrew and in uh, English are actually cattle galore. (laughs) That's the final words. Cattle galore. Animals galore. As strange as that may sound, there's quite a bit in the Bible about God's love for animals. There are laws in in the Jewish law given by Moses that commanded care for your animals. Mustn't ever treat them with cruelty. There's this wonderful passage as well in in the Psalms. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love. Now, I realise this is not the place for a full-blown theology of animals. Wouldn't that be awesome? And and I'd love to share with you my theory of animals in the coming kingdom, but I don't have time for that. I can point you to an Underceptions episode, number 82, where you'll hear all about the theology of animals and my theory of animals in the kingdom, but that's not really my point here. My point is God loves all of creation. He loves all that he has made. There's a final reason for God's compassion toward Nineveh. He thinks it's great. (laughs) Just soak that up. God thinks Nineveh is great. The word gadol in Hebrew, it just means, it can mean uh, big in city, in, in size, but it can just mean really important to someone, really special. And what I find really interesting, it's worth pointing this out, though it may seem a little bit nerdy, the same expression appears in the opening line of the book. Where the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. The opening line of, of, the, of the book tells us that Nineveh is great in wickedness. And the last line of the book, what we call an inclusio, the, the opening and the closing say the same thing. It uses the same expression. Now though... Nineveh is great in God's estimation because they're great in his affections. And I point this out because we've got to get both right, friends, in order to do our mission to the 119,600 people in our immediate area. You've got to believe that this area is great in sin so that we know we must reach them with the gospel or they are lost. But you must also believe they are great in the affections of God. So then you know you're launching out with God's feeling, with God's motivation and with God's power. Great, great. And notice actually that this last sentence of the book of Jonah is a question not a standard sentence with a full stop. Do you notice that? I mean, the, the, the question is, should I not have concern because of these reasons? And then it ends. There's no answer. Like, don't you all want to know what happened to Jonah? Did Jonah repent? You know, there's a medieval, traditional Jewish interpretation that actually says, uh, 
Jonah fell flat on his face and praised the Lord for his mercy. Oh, that's a nice ending. But it's not the ending in Scripture. We have no idea. It just ends with a question, and I think it's a deliberate device because you stop thinking about Jonah. The question comes to us. This is designed to let us as readers receive this question. It's a little bit like the parable of the prodigal son, where you don't hear what the older brother does. The last you heard of the older brother, he's angry, just like Jonah. The last line of the parable of the prodigal son is basically, son, your your son is safe. Shouldn't we celebrate? Oh, the connection between the book of Jonah and the parable of the prodigal son is very, very close. But I want you to notice exactly what the question is. Because the question isn't, will you not have compassion, Jonah? That'd be a good question. That'd be a fine theological question. What's the actual question? Should I, the Lord God, not have compassion on this great city? And this may seem subtle, but I think it's important. The basis of our mission to the world and to the 119,600 people in our immediate area, the basis of this mission is not your compassion. It's God's compassion. And the importance of knowing that is because sometimes, I'll just be really honest with you, I wake up not gushing with love for everyone around me. Am I the only one? Some days, I'm just not there. But since I've been a Christian, I don't think I've ever woken up doubting God's love for the people around me. What drives our mission, first and foremost, is God's compassion. Ultimately, This assurance of God's compassion comes from Jesus. Jesus thought a lot about Jonah. Did you know that? Um, Because he grew up right next to where Jonah's historical town was. Gath Heifer uh, was three miles from Nazareth. And more than that, it's on the road you have to travel from Nazareth to get to Lake Galilee, a trip Jesus did many times. Every time Jesus went through Gath Hefer, he knew, oh, this is the historical place of Jonah. This must have created all sorts of um, synergies with Jesus' own ministry. I mean, and, and, and the spirit of the book of Jonah is everywhere in the life and ministry of Jesus. It's in the prodigal son parable. It's in Jesus' meals with sinners. Above all, it's in Jesus' death and resurrection. And actually, Jesus makes the connection explicit in Matthew chapter 12, where he explicitly says, there's no other sign I'm going to give the world except the sign of Jonah. No sign will be given this generation except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man, that's his way of referring to himself, will be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth, reference to his death, burial, resurrection. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. This deserves a whole sermon, but we're not going to do it. I just want to say this. What God achieved by putting Jonah in a big fish, mercy to the pagan Ninevites, Jesus will achieve through his death, burial, and resurrection, salvation of the whole world. That's the sense in which he is giving the world the sign of Jonah. Except something greater than Jonah is here in Jesus. Christ's death and resurrection leave us in no doubt how God feels about the 119,600 people in an eight mile radius. No doubt about how God feels toward the person you don't like toward your enemies, toward political opponents, toward the guilty sinner. Just before Easter, 
I eventually got around to seeing this marvelous film, The Jesus Revolution. I'm not sure how many of you have seen it, but my daughter had seen it, Josie had seen it and loved it and had been sort of bugging us to watch the film. And I'd even preached at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa where the film is based. And so I thought I'd better eventually get around to watching this thing. And it's the amazing true story of a revival that broke out in America amongst hippies in the late 60s and early 70s. It was astonishing. Because this was a period where everyone was saying that America's going unchristian. <clears throat> in fact, Time Magazine in uh, 1966 had run this headline article, the cover story all about the demise of Christianity in America, titled, Is God Dead? That's 1966. But within just a few years, boom, thousands of hippies with their weird ideologies and sex, drugs and rock and roll were flocking to this square church near Newport Beach, coming to Jesus and then getting baptised in a, a Pirate's Cove. It's a great reminder, isn't it, that nothing's inevitable. Some of the ideologies right now in America and back home are truly weird. Yeah, weirder than the hippies. And you might be looking out at sort of backsliding America and just feel grumpy. But nothing's inevitable, friends. Maybe just around the corner, people will become disillusioned with the secularism in this country and turn back to Jesus. It can happen. May it happen. But the reason I tell you this is there's this really moving scene. It's just like a minute or two in the film. That I will never forget. The church is full of hippies. Oh, by the way, I, I should have said, in 1971, Time magazine had to run this cover story, The Jesus Revolution. Five years earlier, God's dead. <laughs> but there's this moving scene where the church is full of hippies on one side and the traditional, you know, good churches on, the, on this side. And um, there's been some tension because some of the more traditionals um, don't like the fact that these hippies come in without wearing shoes and they smell and some of them come in high as a kite. <laughs> and in this scene, one of the elders stands up in protest and storms out of the building. And we think, oh no, the whole thing's going to fall apart. And then another elder gets up, this guy, and we think, oh no, he's going to go too. But instead, what does he do? He crosses the aisle. And he goes and he sits down with the hippies. <laughs> Friends, right here is the whole history of Christianity. We have sometimes been the judgmental, protesting, smug, angry Jonas. Heading to Tarshish when God wants us to go to Nineveh. Arms folded, looking down our noses at the immoral. And then we remember, don't we? We remember our Lord, who not only taught the parable of the prodigal son about God's love and about the anger of the self-righteous, but actually embodied it in his meals with the sinners of his day and then in his death and resurrection, showing his hand of love to the whole world. And when we remember that, we get up, we cross the aisle and we go sit amongst the rabble, extending God's love to all. Friends, what kind of Christians will we be at Chapel Street? The grumpy, self-righteous, judgmental, smug kind? Who can think of 35 reasons why the judgment of God should come on others? Who has all the right theology, can say all the right things, but whose heart is a million miles from God's? Or will we be like Jesus, embracing the outsider despite their sins, showing them God's compassion, getting amongst them?
the book of Jonah cries out to us today. God himself cries out to us today. Should I not have concern for this great city? Should I not have concern? Lord, be merciful to us. We, your people, sometimes don't chime with your love. Forgive us. Lord, please, above everything today, give us an insight into your love that we might be changed by it. For we ask it in the name of love embodied, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of God... May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the love of God and neighbour and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.